So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in and get started. So again, good morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you today to our panel discussion, which is in honor of LGBTQIA plus History Month. I am Marcel Davis and I am the Health Systems Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And here at the Health System, we are focused on promoting and advancing DEI throughout the health system and the communities we serve. Because our goal is always to ensure that everything we do say and touch is done so with equity at its core. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to my colleagues who are joining me for today's discussion. We've got Joel Mole, Christopher Willibin, Melissa Edwards, Russell Dowell, and Riley North. Many thanks to each of you for taking time out of your very, very busy schedules to be here with us today. I know a few of you actually worked overnight, had the overnight shift at the hospital in the VA. And so I'd like to just say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and staying up with us. Um, so LGBT, LB, LGBTQIA plus History Month occurs every year in October. And this tribute gives us the opportunity to celebrate the diversity and the richness of the LGBTQIA plus community and the, the importance of bringing a light to the challenges that face this community and really give us an opportunity to chat about how we can go about addressing those challenges. This observance was created by Rodney Wilson, who was a history teacher at a Missouri high school in 1994. And the following year, it was aptly dubbed LGBTQ plus history month. It was added to the list of a commemorative set of months in a resolution forwarded by the General Assembly to the higher to the National Education Association. October was chosen as the month of observance because National Coming Out Day already existed as a holiday on October 11th. Additionally, the anniversary of the first March for Gay Rights in Washington took place on October 14th, 1979. So just a little bit of history regarding LGBTQIA plus History Month, why we're here, why it's celebrated. And I'd like now to turn this round table over to our brilliant speakers so that they can introduce themselves to you and share their lived experiences. And I believe, Russ, you'll kick off our intros. Hey everyone, um, yeah, my name's Russell. Um, I am one of the second year residents emergency medicine at VCU. Um, I identify as a gay male and my pronouns are he and him. Thanks, Russ. Melissa, I've got you next on the intro list. Hi, I'm Melissa Edwards. Um, I'm also one of the second year emergency medicine residents um, at VCU. I'm from Richmond, um, originally went to Virginia Tech for undergrad, um, went to VCOM for medical school and back here home um, at VCU. Um, I, I did a fail as a gay female and my pronouns are she, her. Melissa, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Joel? I'm Joel Mall. I'm an associate professor and residency program director in emergency medicine, identify as a gay male and my pronouns are he, him. Joel, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Riley? Hey, everybody. My name is Riley North. I'm one of the first year emergency medicine residents and uh, identify as a gay male, and my pronouns are he, him. Riley, thank you so much. And Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Wollobin. I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician here at VCU. I am also the associate dean for student affairs in the School of Medicine. Uh, I identify as a gay male and my pronouns are he, him. Thank you so much, Chris. And so I promise we've got a rich discussion and I'd like to open it up. We've got several themes we'd like to cover and we'd like to hear from each and every one of you throughout this discussion. And I'd like to start with how old were you when you came out and what was that process like for you? Joel, do you mind starting? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, I guess coming out, it depends on who you're out to um, because I think there's different phases a lot of us go through that you tend to be out to friends and then, you know, things like that. So 
I would say I was um, in my junior year of college when I first uh, letting some of my friends know um, about my identity, or I guess at that point, my feared identity. Um, and then um, as it went on, I think completely out um, really was probably about 10 years later, because it was a time at the time that I was coming of age um, that, you know, there was a lot of fear and there's a lot of negative opinions and attitudes because of the AIDS crisis that was ongoing. So it was dangerous in more ways than just your health. Um, and there were a lot of um, a lot of harassment, a lot of discrimination that happened at that time. So I think the process was a lot longer. I also had conservative family. So I rightly or wrongly decided once I settled with my life partner that uh, that would be a good time to include my family and who I was because they would get to know my life partner and, and like him and be good with that. And fortunately that did happen for me, but, uh, but it was much delayed probably compared to some of our younger uh, panelists. Oh, Joel, thank you so much. And I'd like to turn to one of our younger panelists now before jumping to Chris. Um, Melissa, what was that like for you? Um, I think in contrast to Dr. Moll, um, and I will say this as a qualifying statement, my coming out experience really wasn't all that painful, um, which it's kind of funny that you have to make that qualifying statement because it shouldn't be a painful experience in reality, but for most of us, we know that it is. Um, but nonetheless, it still was later than I anticipated. I came out the year probably after medical school um, because I was in a series of relationships that were still closeted at that time and came into medical school that way. And it was just honestly easier to keep it that way. Um, my family was extremely supportive. Um, and in fact, when I told them, they said that they'd pretty much known all along. And you had that kind of sense of feeling silly for having hid that part of yourself for so long. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, there was still a 2% chance that I felt that I would lose a large support system in telling them something that they maybe didn't know or weren't okay with. Um, and so I feel like since that time frame, I'm still kind of in the process of coming out to um, a large majority of folks, even friends from medical school. Um, and I think in reality too, they probably knew all along, but it wasn't a formal experience in actually telling them. Um, so I feel like right now I'm still kind of going through that process, but I still would say for the most part that everyone here at least would know that I would be out now. Lisa, thank you for sharing that. And that's got to be really difficult, right? If, if the process feels like it's ongoing and there's always that constant fear of not being accepted for who you are um, and the potential of maybe losing your support system to your point. Um, so thank you for your transparency. I appreciate that. Um, um, so I would just add in there that the, I mean, not, not to interfere with anybody else, but I think that's something that's really important for people who aren't identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, you know, or, or along the, the whole spectrum of identification in the community is I am, you know, old enough to be most people except for Chris's dad in this, but uh, it's one of those things where, and I feel kind of like I am in a lot of days as a program director, but it's one of those things that I come out every day. I mean, every time someone assumes that I'm straight and asks me about my wife and things like that, it's coming out every time and you just don't know how people are gonna react. And um, even to this day, it's gotten much better um, than my initial experience. But I think that's something that is sometimes not so well appreciated by others is you're always coming out. I think that's a really good point, Joel. And it's something that I've kind of grappled with, I think in my, life journey uh, as a gay man. Um, I uh, knew for a long time that I was gay, um, but it really wasn't until medical school when I decided to come out. And that's when one of my classmates came out to me and it came, um, I finally found someone that had uh, common interests and uh, it was so hard to meet people. Uh, there was a lot of fear involved with trying to find uh, a partner. Um, you know, going up, growing up in the AIDS epidemic and in the time period where there were a lot of hate crimes, uh, you just weren't sure if you would go some, to some place to meet someone, if it was going to be a safe experience or not. 
And so it finally took me meeting one of my colleagues at my level in school that made me feel safe enough to come out. Um, I actually, uh, when I was uh, 13, uh, I, I uh, asked my parents if I could see a counselor and they took me to see someone. I didn't tell them why, uh, but it was because I was struggling with my identity and, and not sure what to do about it. And unfortunately at the time, uh, the therapist that I saw uh, attempted to do conversion therapy, which basically tried to reprogram the way I thought about other men. Uh, and I think that kind of set me back a little bit too, uh, that I was really trying to become someone that I wasn't. Uh, and it was, it really took meeting someone else uh, that was one of my peers that was comfortable coming out that, that helped me uh, pro progress along that journey. Wow, Chris, I, that must have been incredibly difficult and traumatizing for you. I mean, at any age, but you were 13. Um, and I can't imagine what that must have been like for you. And I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, you know, looking back at it now, I, I don't think I realized as, as at the time how harmful it was, but it definitely uh, made me think a little bit more seriously about when and, and who to come out to. Uh, it did take me quite some time to come out to my family. And when I did finally come out to them, uh, I was almost 30. <laughs> Uh, they were saying that we were just waiting for you. We knew <laughs> that, that all along and, and they were going to be supportive. So I think that's a struggle point for a lot of people is, are they going to be accepted by their friends? Are they going to be accepted by their family? Um, I, you know, working in a pediatric emergency medicine, uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of the LGBT youth uh, who come to the ED with, um, you know, psychiatric concerns, mental health concerns. Uh, suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety. And one of the common themes is that there's often a lot of family conflict uh, with their ability to feel like they have a safe environment at home. And um, I just feel like it is something that if they don't have that support, it can be really challenging. Yeah, a huge percentage of homeless youth, up to 40%, identifies LGBTQ+. And that's wow you know, shows you what devastation is potential. I think most of us have had, although certainly not, a, I wouldn't say a completely easy coming out process. Mm -hmm. And we've been fortunate that we found support in our family and our friends um, for the most part. Yeah, that's a great point. Chris, thank you so much. And Joel, I appreciate you chiming in. Riley and Russ, how about you? Riley, talk to me first. Um, tell us what it's been like for you. Yeah, I'd say um, my, my story kind of echoes Melissa's in that, um, like, I, I grew up in, like, a Catholic background, went to Catholic school, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, it's a short story, or long story short, just it was not, like, the best background to, to you know, have an affirming uh, search or coming to realization of my identity. Um, and I was actually closeted all through undergrad. And then there was just so much like mental stress uh, surrounding like my own, like, like personal identity realization. And I actually waited until I got into medical school too, because I wanted to have like some good news to like buffer some potentially negative news and um, ended up coming out, you know, to a, a few friends before the fact and then officially to my family, like right as I got into school and it went very smoothly. Um, but it, I, I like 100% agree with Melissa's sentiment that like, no matter how well you think it might go, there's always this small chance that it doesn't. And that you're from like saying just a few words, like your relationship with somebody that you love completely changes. Wow, so, so difficult. Riley, thank you for that. How about you, Russ? Um, yeah, I think that, um, I think we're showing a theme and that it's well represented, but that my mind kind of lined up more with Riley and Melissa's that 
Um, I came out my senior year of college and similar to Riley grew up in a very like Catholic background and um, parents like taught CCD school and went to Catholic high school and such and um, so you have that reservations of coming out and that the church doesn't accept you and that your parents follow the church closely and um, so that kind of gives you a block of that uh, you infer that they're not going to accept you. Um, and then I had a really close friend that she came out before me and that her parents didn't have a good reaction and she was kicked out of her household and ended up living with my family for a short period of time. Um, and so I think that like, you know, we all have our like combination of things that makes us reserved of coming out. Um, I, I, yeah, I, and the process actually turned out to be really well that it came out my senior year and my parents were um, to me, surprisingly, like very accepting and, um, you know, they had the same reaction of we were just waiting for you and we're happy that you did. And I, I was thankful for the experience I was, but I know a lot of people that didn't have the same experience I did. And um, it just makes you appreciate when you know people close to you that had it differently than I did. Russ, thank you for that. So you've all, Russ is right. There's a common theme here, right? Um, I think my next question really is around, you're all in medicine, right? So you've had, you've had this application process for college, med school. Um, do you disclose how, do you disclose? And if so, how do you disclose on your applications who you are? And Russ, because you are the last person who, who answered the last question. Um, I'd love for you to start first. Do you? Yeah, do no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, with, um, you go through this process of, do you want that to identify you? And, you know, it's such an important aspect of your life and it's such like a monumental change that's, um, I think like initially that I had reservations of putting it on my like medical school application and such and um, just uh, decided that um, that like, you know, this is me that like, I don't want to go to a program that doesn't accept who I am and I've kind of gone through that process and I don't want to accept that anymore. Um, so I did I did disclose that, um, you know, this is how this is my sexuality and then this is my this is how I identify and um, but I think it is like kind of, I, I went through that process of being reserved to put that at first. Thank you for that, Russ. Riley, what's that like for you? Do you disclose on your applications? I did choose to disclose. Um, and I kind of incorporated it in my personal statement as to one of the fields within medicine and like patient interactions that I was interested in. Um, I think I made that decision, you know, I was applying to programs over the last year where there was obviously a lot of like social progress and awareness. So I think kind of within the setting of like Black Lives Matter and just like overall push for like more social um, acceptance across the board, I just felt that it was really important that I make that clear. Uh, you know, and like a part of who I was to programs, because I didn't want to go somewhere that wasn't going to accept that or, you know, support that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Raleigh, thank you. Melissa, I'm going to turn to you before asking Chris and Joel, because their generation is different, right? They're in my generation, I think. Um, <laughs> Melissa, do you disclose? And if so, um, is that a difficult process for you to determine? So actually, um, I'm a little bit different in that I did not disclose my identity on my applications. Uh, I do believe that intrinsically, of course, there was that fear and reservation of what that would look like to programs. But I think in addition, sadly, um, coming from an osteopathic school, I feel like there was also a lack of understanding of what that means to be a physician with the differences there, which are slim, um, but still not well understood to a multitude of programs. And honestly, I felt that there could be a degree of holding both against me and trying to um, 
find a program that would be a good fit with, for me. But I think actually um, in, in my favor, it worked out because the programs that I did interview, I would say it during my interview with program leadership, also in the pre-interview dinners. And I'm much more of a person that relies on reactions in person than having just my application rejected before I even know why. And so I thought that it was actually very helpful to gauge people's reactions and genuine interest or lack of understanding or what have you in person in that way. Um, so while it was kind of a, a fear, um, it actually ended up being, I think, helpful for me to make my decision in the program that I wanted to choose. That's awesome. Thank you, Melissa. I'm like that too. I, I gauge um, in-person interactions a lot more than I do pieces of paper. So thank you for sharing that. Chris, I'd love to hear from you um, because your applications were at a different time. And did you disclose then? Um, and what was, what was that process like for you? That's a great question. So when I was applying to medical school and residency, I did not disclose anything on my application itself, but I did find some trusted uh, faculty members who I had felt comfortable coming out to that I knew were also out and got their advice about whether or not I should disclose and uh, what that might look like. Um, and I think in that day and time, it just wasn't something that was a, a safe thing to do. Um, and I use that now when I work with students to kind of frame that question. In fact, um, you know, Riley was one of my former students. I serve as the, um, uh, the faculty advisor for our Med Pride group, which is a student organization for LGBTQIA plus students. And one of the sessions that we do is talking about this exact topic. Uh, is it safe to disclose on your application to residency programs? And the way I view it now is if you're comfortable enough disclosing and you will be able to sort for programs that are going to be supportive of you. If someone picks up your paper application and they see that you've been, been involved in med pride and you uh, make a reference to your sexual orientation in your personal statement, and they were gonna have an issue with that, it's not the program you wanna end up at. And it's gonna be something that's not a good fit. And so trying to be genuine and honest, it's a difficult decision for some students to make, but I'm seeing people do it more comfortably. And we're also working at the medical school level to make awareness that we're gonna be a supportive environment for LGBT students. Um, we have made sure in our application process that we've included asking about pronouns. Uh, we have given resources to students to be able to meet with a student rep from Med Pride uh, if they're interested to in the interview process. Uh, we do a lot to try to create an inclusive environment. In fact, I kind of out myself to students in the first week of orientation by referring to my ex as he and just kind of subtly working that into conversation and making it part of the norm. Uh, and so, I do think we have a lot of work to do, uh, but I think regarding applications to residency programs, uh, I hope that students make that decision based on trying to find the most supportive program for them. That's powerful, Chris. Thank you. Joel, I'm gonna turn to you. Did you disclose when you were doing your applications? Um, not at all. And in fact, um, I one time got a gift from a drug rep um, which was quite nice. And I was carrying around and, you know, some of the other, you know, I know that's forbidden now, but it was a little bit loose back in the day. And I remember my program director specifically saying to me that gift better be from a woman, not a man. And um, then on top of that, uh, we had a thing at the end of residency after we graduated where they would do like a board review course for us as we got ready for our boards. And um, shortly before that, a mutual friend outed me to an entire residency group and entire community and faculty. And so I didn't go to that, but it was, I mean, nobody focused on the board of view. It was just like, I can't believe Joel's gay and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it was a very different time, but obviously that made me very cautious of how this would affect me professionally. But I strongly agree with Chris. I, I think, you know, the one thing in my journey that I have determined is how important visibility is. I've made the resolution that 
I can help others and I can help others be who they are and be hopefully accepted who they are because, you know, we have this, you know, big tapestry of humanity that really we all have to be, you know, aware of, we all have to interact with, we all, and as emergency medicine physicians, being the safety net, I think it's really important that we all have some cultural humility in that area. Um, the one thing I will say is on the other side of things as a program director for looking at applicants and applications and things as they come in, you know, there's definitely been a shift, you know, for the positive, because I would hear people say, like, why are they putting this on their application? You know, why are they talking about this in their interview to now people are actively recruiting, not at every program, but a lot of programs They want people who are LGBT plus, and that's actually a positive thing because they want to have a diverse and inclusive program. So that's, that's definitely step forward. Um, we're not fully there yet, unfortunately. So anything we all can do to support the community, I think just enriches us all. I absolutely agree. And, you know, Chris, <laughs> you you articulated it, which sort of summarized what everyone else said, which is, and I want to I want to pull on that thread, because when we fill out applications, we always think I'm waiting on them to choose me. Right. But as applicants, regardless how you identify we get to choose the program too. We get to make the decision whether this is a, a program that we wanna even align with because do they accept me for who I really am? And so I appreciate all of you sharing that because that's a key part of that process. So thank you so much for sharing your personal stories. And I see that we got a question from Dr. Denza and Dr. Denza, that's actually one of our questions. So I do wanna jump to that because it was asked, which is, we're doing so much at VCU Health System and in the health sciences to support the LGBTQIA plus community. We know that there is a lot more that we can do, but what are we doing here at the health system and health sciences to support the community and what can we do better? And Joel and Chris, I'm gonna look to you first to share because there's a lot of information in the health sciences and I'd love for you to talk about the Outlist as one thing and all of the other efforts in the health sciences. And I'm happy to share anything that's going on in the health system. So Joel, do you mind kicking us off? And Chris, I'd love for you to chime in. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think some of this is definitely being done at the program level and some of this certainly is being done at the health system level. I mean, for us as a program, you know, literally my first or second slide after the introduction when people come here is that, to state as a value that we are a diverse inclusive residency program and everyone is welcome to come here regardless of who you are, what you believe, where you come from or who you love. And I think that's really important to set that as a value for the healthcare system. I think the healthcare system has been doing that. And one of the ways they're doing that is the outlist, which was actually spearheaded by Riley and some of his medical student um, colleagues who came forward and wanted to create an outlist, which we hadn't had before. And what an outlet basically is, is a, each, a lot of universities will have an opportunity for people to be visible because in the LGBTQ plus community, being visible is so incredibly important because we can all hide, we can have people speculate, but really it's to be out and kind of normalize. You know, we're part of who VCU Health is, we're part of who, you know, the emergency department is, is so incredibly powerful. And again, something I've learned from my journey and adamantly believe in. And so people have the opportunity, they can sign up for the outlist, they can put their picture on, they can be identified, uh, you know, who they are. And I would strongly encourage people to do that. It's active now. Um, it does take some, some courage for sure. Um, there have been some people that are concerned about how others might react to that. So obviously we're not asking anybody to out themselves who's not ready to do that. But I think it's incredibly powerful to show prospective applicants that yes, we have a community here. Yes, you have support here. Yes, you're welcome here. And um, hopefully that's been something that will continue to grow and as we go on. I think those things are uh, mutually important not to mention some of the things with like epic coming down the road that we have the ability to allow people to put pronouns in there and develop, you know collect information about sexual orientation and gender identity or soji information and i think that's a huge step forward as well um, we also in emergency medicine i distributed the residency wanted and pronoun badges um, so that can help to reflect to our patients um, that we're inclusive um, even if they don't identify um, as transgender so and Chris, I know there's tons of stuff going on at the school of medicine level as well. 
Yeah, you uh, hit on a bunch of them already, which is great. And I was really uh, glad to see the recent training that we had about uh, the upcoming transition to Epic and just simply asking patients about their pronoun choices, their uh, sexual orientation, um, just creating that culture uh, makes patients feel more welcome. And they, you, you never know what the answer you may get from someone. And um, I've, I've seen that play out uh, time and time again in the ED where we'll have uh, parents that will come in and you know, uh, you, you'll hear someone say, oh, what does your husband do? Oh, actually, it's my wife. <laughs> and I think if we don't uh, assume certain roles uh, in, in families and, and give people the opportunity to express, you know, what, what their family situation is like, that's just a, a, a plus in making everyone feel more welcome. Uh, at the school of medicine level, uh, again, we're doing a lot of the things that are being done at the health system level as well. We do have pronoun pins available for medical students to pick up uh, to wear in their ID badge in our office. Um, we have done a, a, a hopefully a, a good job of uh, in the admissions process, again, changing some questions on our application and providing resources for students to connect with LGBT students uh, at the school of medicine. Um, we try to create an inclusive environment um, um, and, and really want to, to make sure that we're incorporating this into the curriculum. Uh, and that's been a little bit more of a slower moving process. But for example, in our practice of clinical medicine course, which is the doctoring course uh, that we teach our first and second year students, they now uh, ask in all of their standardized patient interactions, uh, you know, about pronoun choice for, for the, the patients that they're interacting with. So it's, uh, we're, we're beginning to make some curriculum change to uh, using some cases that look at LGBTQ health issues. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of work still that needs to be done, but we're on, on that road. Yeah. And to that point, um, <clears throat> Chris also knows that uh, there's a consortium through all levels of VCU, not just the School of Medicine that's working on um, after we got kind of a, a really thoughtful list of um, things we can do to make the curriculum more inclusive in this matter. And so that is a group, um, again, from main campus, from the medical campus, looking at the School of Medicine curriculum um, to try to make sure that we are, are teaching things correctly, that there's no hidden curriculum of, you know, being, you know, one way or the other, you know, you're um, in a kind of heteronormative uh, curriculum that, you know, a lot of assumptions are made, like assuming that I have a wife or, you know, things like that. Clearly, there's a lot going on, but we've still got a lot of work to do. Melissa, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what changes have you seen since you've been here? Um, and what other changes would you like to see? Um, I think I just kind of wanted to reference back to Dr. Mole's point of creating an inclusive culture um, and what we've kind of already been talking about in choosing the program. Um, I think, you know, I still remember that slide and I think I really remember that being a huge reason of why I chose the program, as silly as it may seem, because that's exactly the environment that we're all craving and looking for. Um, and I think additionally, I always tell folks this too, we did a team building exercise our first week and it started out kind of innocuous, you know, stand up if your favorite color is green. Um, and then it kind of progressed from there. Um, you know, if you've ever lived in poverty or if you've ever had any sort of, um, negative connotation with being gay, and I think our program learned a lot about each other in that moment and really started to help us bond as far as colleagues. Um, because I think certainly as we are, as you can tell, we're all in emergency medicine. I don't think that's by accident. I think that we all enjoy taking care of a diverse patient population. Um, and the central tenant to that is that we take care of anyone at any time for anything. And I think the fact that we're actively recruiting people that have that same um, mentality, as well as purposefully choosing folks that are going to reflect 
our diverse patient population and the providers that are taking care of them is it hugely important. Um, some of the things that I do personally also just kind of touch to Dr. Wollivan's points as well. The pronoun pins, I think, are excellent. Um, I also use a badge reel that's um, pride colored. I've had a, a number of various comments on that. And then um, never assuming roles as well. Um, and the way that I try to do that with my patients is saying, who did you bring with you? Um, so you don't have that kind of foot and mouth moment of something unexpected. And so I think it kind of starts at the individual level, then it builds to the program level. And then really at the, the health system, it's just creating that blanket inclusive environment in which we all want to come to work and take care of our patients um, and, and do that at the best level that we can. And yeah, a quick shout out to Melissa. Um, she helped us with a uh, didactic uh, that we did last year. And it was kind of her uh, idea and thought uh, based on that help that uh, we got the, the pronoun badges and things like that. So she's been a, a great advocate as well. Melissa, you're awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I made a note of that. It starts with the individual first, then the program level, then the system level. So thank you for that. I'm gonna make sure I incorporate that as I advocate for future change. Um, I appreciate that. Riley, I heard Dr. Mole say earlier that you were instrumental um, in the outlist, the efforts of the outlist. I'd love for you to share what, why you saw that as being important um, now that it's here and then what other changes you think are necessary. Yeah, so just kind of to bring everyone else who may be listening up to speed. So outlist is just kind of a, a web page um, that's on like a public facing area associated with like an academic institution um, that just kind of, you know, compiles a list of people who are have openly and voluntarily shared their identity uh, and maybe any other aspect of them that they feel is relevant. Uh, and it just serves as a, a way to increase visibility and improve uh, connectedness between queer people that are, you know, already there. Um, we're just making them visible. Um, and this is something that's present at several other like big academic institutions. And just like from being here myself, like I know that we have that representation here at VCU. Um, so I just floated the idea to, you know, a few faculty and to the Med Pride group. And I said like, hey, like, you know, we have the same people here, like, let's, this is something that I think is important to push and, um, you know, get established here within VCU, um, both in terms of, like, local interconnectedness, but also for recruitment efforts, you know, like, if we really take the initiative to make this happen, then we'll show people that, you know, this is a, a community that welcomes you. Um, and in terms of other stuff, so, you know, we do see a lot of, particularly in the, the pediatric emergency department, we do see like quite a few trans and non-binary patients who both use different pronouns than uh, most people might assume just based on their appearance, but they also use different names. Um, and right now we have kind of a clunky system for making this known to like anybody who might be involved in the care of those patients. Um, so I think this really, you know, comes down to like system level changes. So we're transitioning to Epic as has been mentioned already. So hopefully there's like a, a, a way to kind of make preferred names um, as opposed to kind of like legal or birth names. Uh, the preferred name for the patient too, because if somebody's presenting with a psychiatric complaint and then the medical team like dead names or uses the incorrect name for the patient, like in every single encounter, like we're not helping them. We're, we're actively causing harm. To, to follow up on what Riley just said, um, the, and to give some feedback on how it's working, the outlist, um, we have had a number of our medical school applicants this year say that they chose to apply to VCU because we had that 
on our website. And that was this great feedback to hear that it is working and, and getting some awareness and making people feel safe. That's awesome. I was just going to add in there really quick to what Riley said is, you know, you, when you misgender a patient or, you know, refuse to respect how they want to be addressed, I mean, that is ultimately against patient-centered care, which is what people all say that we're here to do. Absolutely. And Chris, right when you said that, I immediately went down because I was looking for the reaction that I could put the heart on there. I don't have that. All I have is the raised hand. <laughs> So thank you for sharing that, that the fact that visibility matters, representation matters, and the fact that potential students are seeing the outlist and articulating to you, to us, to our, to our representatives that it is welcoming and they feel safe coming here and it makes them want to apply here makes me really, really happy because while we know we've done incremental things, we still know we have a long way to go, but we're making an impact and, and that's incredibly important. So thank you for that. Um, Russ, talk to me about what changes you've seen since you've been here and what do you think we have left to do? Yeah, I think that, you know, they've touched on um, kind of most of the things I've seen. I, um, I agree with Melissa and I think that uh, Mole's presentation on interview day had a big impact um, that no other really program that I interviewed at was that transparent. Um, and I think that that should be something that all programs have. I'm glad that at least our specialty is doing it. And I've even heard of other specialties calling emergency medicine, the gay specialty. Um, so I, I think that, you know, there's still always room to make. And I think like what Riley said with identifying patients uh, um, should be foremost and um, something that we can easily change. Um, but, you know, there's always room in the future too. Another thing I thought of uh, just to kind of maybe more fully answer Dr. Dinza's question is what do we do for our community? And I think that is an area of growth that we can embrace as a health system as well. Um, you know, encouraging our faculty, staff, students to volunteer with community organizations that support LGBTQIA initiatives. Um, I think having a visibility at pride events, um, just making sure that VCU shows that there is support of the, this community and, and finding ways to get involved and volunteer in local grassroots movements. Uh, I don't know if we do a, a really good job of that at an organized level. Yeah, I will say uh, when I was at Great um, Emory and Grady, I used to volunteer at the Pride Medical Booth, and it was awesome. Um, I got good parking at Pride for that. Uh, that was my my perk, but it was also kind of cool just to feel like you're helping your community. And I made a note of that because I will see how we can at least advance those efforts. So thank you for raising that. Um, I do know that one of the things that I advocate for is, um, Chris and Joel, you talked about um, the learning modules related to um, the go live with EPIC and the learning module specific to sexual orientation and gender identification or SOGI is the acronym and the data collection efforts related to SOGI. And, um, you know, I had a, a some, some team members who are not patient facing who said, I'm not really sure, you know, I should have to take this because I'm not patient facing. And my response was everyone has to take it because we have two populations here in my mind, right? We have patient facing roles or two types of roles rather. We have patient facing roles, but then we have team members who support those who are in patient facing roles. And as a health system, we all have that mindset of one VCU, one team, one fight. Myself, I support all of you who are, who are in patient facing roles in order for me to understand and support you and align with you, I need to see what you see. I need to learn what you learn and I need to be equipped to be able to respond in similar ways. And so that is one thing that we continue to advocate for as leaders that that SOGI learning module is mandatory for all. Um, whether you're in patient-facing roles or not. Um, 
that's one piece. The second is round tables like this. Um, sadly, we don't have them often because everyone is so incredibly busy. And I think about what the last 19, 20 months have been like. Um, you all who are practicing physicians, you teach, you all are so busy because um, you're saving lives, right? You're, you're fighting lives, life and death situations mm -hmm. out there. And I mean, that's a service that, gosh, we so appreciate, we honor, um, we're committed to. And we try to find time when we can to have these discussions. But when we do have it, the goal is always to build awareness and increase conversation in a respectful manner so that we can learn. Because we don't all know everything, but how do we do better until we can have a conversation and find where those opportunities are? So Chris, thank you for pointing out that we do have an opportunity related to community efforts. I will take that back and see how we can work to advance that. I do have one more question. Um, and this, I'm thinking the answers may split down the generational line. Um, so I'm curious to see what it'll be. Um, and the question really is, What's your experience been like to navigate medicine as a member of the LGBTQ plus community? Um, and Joel, I'd love to start with you and Chris first, and then I'd like to shift to Russ Riley and Melissa because I'd like to see if generationally we've made progress. Um, so Chris, I'd love for you to start. Sure, um, I um, picked my primary care physician because I knew she was someone who was very open-minded. And in our first appointment, she said, I know that I am not uh, LGBT uh, member of that community myself, but she's like, I will do research and I'll make sure that I provide you with the best care possible. Uh, so shout out to Mandy George in our internal medicine department. She's a, a fantastic clinician and um, she just makes me feel safe. And she knows that I might have different things that she needs to consider just because of my lifestyle, uh, different risk factors I may have that other patients that she cares for doesn't. And she's just done an amazing job of, of acknowledging that and, and making me feel welcome. Um, and so I've been very fortunate to have uh, excellent health care. Um, you know, it was probably not uh, the same uh, when I was in, in medical school and before. And, and again, I probably wasn't aware of some of the things that I needed. Uh, but, but now that I've had that PCP for the past you know, uh, number of years, I, I feel very comfortable and safe. Yeah, one quick thing about the SOGI information too that people may not realize is, you know, obviously first and foremost is about giving dignity to our patients. But the other thing that's so important about it is um, one of the things electronic medical records are good for is looking at data for healthcare disparities. And that's something that has not been collected uniformly uh, to date. Um, and it's getting better uh, with you know, systems such as Epic and other platforms. But there's a lot of healthcare disparities we know exist but can't really quantify or qualify in the LGBTQ community. So, and that's something that is different than you know, looking at men versus women, looking at people by race or ethnicity that have been collected for a long period of time. So, I mean, I'm hoping as we move forward, we'll be able to better take care of the population for that reason as well. So another reason for everybody to know about SOGI stuff. Um, but as far as my journey, it's been a little different um, in that, you know, I've had uh, type one diabetes since age four. So I have navigated the healthcare system continuously and constantly uh, all my life. Um, and I can tell you that probably the best care I got um, ever was when I had a provider who also identified as LGBT because they actually asked questions and they actually knew some things about it, whereas other people assumed I was straight and just assumed that, you know, never said anything to me about, hey, should you be tested for HIV? Should you get hepatitis A immunization? Things like that, that often caretakers don't necessarily know because the, there's such a lack of education, um, you know, both in undergraduate medical education and also graduate medical education, which I know efforts are trying to make that better, but it's still a significant gap that I think in healthcare. So I felt that personally, and it's mainly, I think on a social level than anything else, you know, feeling comfortable with your doctor and thinking, can I say my spouse is a man as opposed to my, you know, that I have a husband instead of a wife. And I think 
I'm probably gotten brazen enough in my older age that I that I do that. But it's one of those things you always wonder, is it safe? And that's something I think that's so important because that's what our patients feel. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Um, Melissa, how about you? I'd like to see if there's a, a shift in the generational response. Um, I would I would say that there probably is, and I think that's to the credit of mentors such as Dr. Mull and Dr. Wollobin, who have kind of opened the door for the inclusive um, environment that we've been kind of touching on for the past uh, hour or so. Um, and I think for me, um, some of the changes to that um, I'm still seeing and still learning about is navigating residency. Um, not only as someone who identifies as a part of the LGBTQ uh, community, but also as a female. Um, I think, you know, emergency medicine as a whole is a predominantly a male-driven population. Um, and so trying to navigate that um, as a provider that, and having a, a voice is, is is difficult at times, but I think that overall we have a very supportive um, bunch of colleagues that um, kind of understand that. And I think that we have um, certainly recruited more females into our program as well, which has been helpful. Um, but I think some of the things too that, you know, we maybe haven't touched on is sometimes just the comments from our patients that can be difficult to deal with as well. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from marital status, um, even ageism really, because um, we are on the younger side <laughs> in our training. Um, and so that's that's been kind of a challenge for, for me moving forward and trying to how my responses are to those questions. Because um, again, a place of reservation, it can be difficult to disclose that about yourself to a patient um, and, you know, I, I'm still figuring out how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely understand. Thank you for sharing that. Russ, how about you? What's it like to navigate the community? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, credit to the people before us that it has changed. I got a PCP and didn't think twice about um, telling him and asking for tests and as such. And I think that me being comfortable um, with that kind of relates back. Um, I do want to put my plug in and is that like I have close friends um, and people near and dear to me that are um, open and willing to tell that they're HIV positive and I still think that we have like a lot of work especially as medical professionals that it's not as I guess I'm getting a little off topic but still correlates that still something that we have a lot of awareness to improve on and there's a lot of stigmas about it and I think maybe in the medical community that we can still improve on that of, you know, getting in pools doesn't spread HIV and, you know, just little nonsense stuff like that, that we're in the position to make those changes. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of where we're headed next, hopefully, and some more awareness that we can get. Powerful, Russ. Thank you so much. Riley, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, so I think just kind of echoing what Russell and Melissa said, like, I think my personal experience has been overall good and positive um, in terms of both receiving care and providing care. I did just want to mention that, you know, we are all kind of a, all the panelists are cisgender and white. So, you know, we, we can only attest to that experience. Um, I do know anecdotally through friends who themselves are trans, like getting like affirming healthcare as a trans person is still significantly challenging. I think that's a particular area um, that we don't receive a lot of, if any, uh, formal medical education or clinical exposure to. Uh, frequently providers will take it upon themselves um, to educate themselves um, and then kind of carve out that, that niche for themselves clinically. Um, so that's an ongoing area that we really need to, to focus on. Riley, I totally I... agree with Riley there and that we are making some efforts in our medical education curriculum 
to incorporate um, important aspects of uh, trans uh, care into the curriculum. Uh, and again, we have a long way to go, but we're uh, beginning to make those steps. So That's so important. And I, wow, I mean, we have steps in place, right? But we we really do have so much more work to do, which actually leads me to a question that one of our audience members put in the chat. And I'd love to toss it out to you all um, for you to weigh in. And I just wanna read it to you. Um, it says, what resources and support, it's sort of a two-part question. What resources and support can be provided for team members that may be struggling to come out or who have already come out, having options available to help with the mental health of our employees that need support. Also, providing support and resources for those that are struggling to accept LGBTQ+, but willing to try and understand and looking for someone to help support and guide them. So it's really about resources and support. Um, so I'd love to turn the question over to you um, what resources and support have you found exist for our team members and students? Um, whoever would like to take that question. This one's not VC specific, but one I actually used in my coming out process was the kind of propaganda that it gets better. Um, it's like a big website that they do and they do a lot of videos and they do a lot of advocating and um, uh, it really helped me during the process. And so I think, you know, if someone's going through that struggle process, it's uh, an easy website to kind of look up and look at people's stories and hear other people in their process. And it provides reassurance that it is difficult, but it does get better. In addition to that, I would say, you know, obviously all of us have been through some semblance of this, right? Everybody's individual stories are different and certainly as, as Riley, you know, importantly points out, you know, we tried to, as we put this together, tried to get some more diverse members, but um, that, uh, you know, and the time we had was kind of challenging and you don't want to ever obviously force anybody to discuss something they're uncomfortable with. But if you look at like the out list, um, that's a resource to say, these are people who are comfortable, you know, being publicly out and, you know, they are people that you can reach out to and, you know, ask what resources they used. And it may be different for different circumstances. Obviously, you know, what, what uh, Russ and Melissa and Riley are going to for resources are probably very different than what myself and Chris did um, when we were going through that purpose. But sometimes it just takes somebody that wants to listen or if somebody wants to be educated. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time doing education stuff in emergency medicine, um, you know, obviously not beyond here at a national level and in other organizations, even outside of emergency medicine. So, I mean, there's resources on campus available. And if you ask around or go to the outlets, I think people can get you to that point. Um, Cause you know, we all want to make sure that, you know, we are inclusive and we're get, again, giving dignity to the patients that we serve and also the employees and our, our colleagues that we work with. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things I always say is the patient is the patient and the students. Those are the two um, populations who are always at the forefront of everything we do. Um, and it's important that each of us take the time to educate ourselves in order to have a conversation, an informed conversation with someone else. So Cody, thank you for your question. I know we have two minutes. I can't believe the time has flown by. I'd like to ask if any of you have any quick thoughts you'd like to share before I close this out? Um, anyone, any final thoughts? I would just like to thank you for hosting the session and uh, facilitating the, the questions. And I think, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think this would have ever happened when I was a resident here at BCU 20 some years ago. And it's just nice to see the progress that's being made. So I really appreciate all the work that you and your team members are doing to help create a more inclusive environment in our uh, health system and in our community. Uh, your work is really appreciated. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. But teamwork really does make the dream work because I do not operate in a silo. I mean, look, like we, I reached out and you all made this happen. So 
thank you so much. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything that I, that I do without any of you. So I appreciate that. Thank you all so much. This has been a truly powerful discussion and I was excited to learn in the last like 10 minutes that as an organization, we do sponsor the pride parade. So there is evidence of community efforts and I commit to working to increase those efforts. I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. I am so, so privileged to have shared this space and time with you. I've learned so much from you. Many thanks to our virtual audience. You could have been anywhere this morning, and yet you chose to be here with us celebrating LGBTQIA plus History Month. If you need to reach me, my email address is marcel.davis at vcuhealth.org. Thank you again. Y'all be safe and have an amazing day. Thank you. Take care.